As I begin my second video, I want to pay attention now to the papacy instituted. I'm going to begin by going over some name changes that took place. First, like uh, Abram to Abraham, Jacob to Israel, and uh, Simon, son of Jonah, to Peter. And if you look at some verses that I have listed here, uh, pay attention to Genesis 17, 1 through 5. Uh, paying more attention to verse 5 where Abram is changed to Abraham. Then go over to Genesis 35, 1 through, through 14 with particular attention to verse 10 where Jacob is changed to Israel. And then in Matthew 16, 17 through 18 where Simon, son of Jonah, is changed to Peter. If you read those verses in Genesis 17 and in Genesis 35, you will find that a promise came with a name change. And then when you look in uh, Matthew chapter 16, where Peter's name is uh, uh, changed, you will find that a twofold promise came with the changing of, of uh, Peter's name. And that twofold promise was that, uh, that he, upon his name he would build his church. The second part of that promise would be, and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. So with each name change that took place, also came a promise. To some people that might not be uh, significant, uh, but to me it is a, a very significant detail that I think people need to pay closer attention to. Having said that, let me turn to the name change of Peter now. And in all the commentaries that I listed that will be in the sidebar, each one of those non-Catholic writers agree that it is Peter it is the object that Christ is talking to. In other words, Peter is the rock. It's not Peter's faith. It is, it is Peter that is the rock. Of that, Plummer writes this, Peter is the rock that Christ built uh, his church on and is the steward Christ entrusted with the keys to the kingdom. He goes on to say, Concerning the non-Catholic view on Peter, as the rock, Plummer explains, the faith of Peter is not an adequate explanation that it had to be the rock that Jesus was talking about, and that would be Peter. He goes on to say then about the church itself, it was a body of men united by common convictions and aims. <clears throat> and about this thing about the uh, uh, Peter being Petros and Peter, which is... Uh, uh, masculine and feminine, he says this, <clears throat> No stress whatever can be laid on the change of gender from masculine to feminine. In speaking Aramaic, Jesus would have clearly used the word Cephas in both cases, which can only refer to Peter as that rock. And all four of those commentaries, again by non-Protestants, agree that Peter had to be the rock. In fact, John A. Broadus in his commentary, uh, and by the way, John A. Broadus is a Baptist, and he disagrees with a lot of the Catholic doctrines. But concerning Peter, he says it is quite clear that is in, in Matthew chapter 16 <coughs> that the rock being referred to can be none other than Peter. And while we may disagree with the Catholics on other things, it would be inconceivable to say that the rock is not Peter that Christ is referring to. Upon this rock, Peter, Christ would build his church. Matthew remembers writing to a Jewish audience uh, so they would understand this. And Peter being a Jew himself, I'm convinced would have fully understood what Jesus' intentions were here. Uh, if you would go back to Isaiah chapter 51, you would read there where uh, Abraham was called a rock as well. So it, di it did not rob God of anything for Abraham to be called a rock. In fact, God is calling him the rock. So it did not rob God of anything for Abraham to be called a rock. No more than it robs Jesus of any of his deity for Peter to be called that rock as well. In talking about these keys men and trying to tie this together, let me read you something out of Isaiah. And you read the whole passages there together in Isaiah 22, 1 through 25. But in 22, this statement is made <clears throat> about when these keys have changed hands. I will place on his shoulders the keys of the house of David. He shall open, and no one shall shut, and he shall shut, and no one shall open. 
I am convinced throughout my study of the of the scripture that in the New Testament when a uh, person makes a reference to the Old Testament and it is clear that Jesus is referring back to Matthew I mean excuse me that Jesus is referring back to Isaiah chapter 22 concerning these keys it is clear to me that when a New Testament writer makes a reference back to the Old Testament as Jesus has done that they intended for us to go back and look in the Old Testament to see the typology there of what it represented there and then to incorporate that into the New Testament and that is what Jesus is doing here uh, the Davidic kingdom is one of the is one of the, the themes of the book of Matthew he opens it up with the line of David this is a dynasty that's going on this is the, the the Davidic kingdom the Davidic dynasty that will never end as God promised David and here he has a gatekeeper in Isaiah 22 or a prime minister or a, or a person who is in charge of opening and closing those doors and in absence of the uh, uh, the king himself this person is in charge of that kingdom or in our David's house or in the New Testament that kingdom and the, it is very clear to me that Jesus Look back at Isaiah 22. And now it is our responsibility then to incorporate that into Matthew chapter 16 to see what he's trying to say there. And it, it, it becomes clear to me that a new institute is taking place now. That is the church. It's no longer that castle or that temple or whatever. It is now the church. And just as the person in, in Isaiah 22, the prime minister or the person in charge of opening and closing to, uh, to David's uh, throne so to speak now that responsibility or the prime minister the keys are being handed over to Peter where he now becomes the prime minister where he now becomes that gatekeeper that person who looses and binds and to me it is a clear reference to Isaiah 22 to bring that over into uh, Matthew chapter 16 to make that connection and it is something that the Jewish people have understood. It's something that Peter would have understood right then. That from that point on, he was the one who would be the prime minister in charge of the uh, kingdom of God to bind and loosen. The king was going away, but he was leaving someone in charge. And that was a continual office that never ended. It wasn't as though one left and they didn't have another one. That office continued. And there in Isaiah chapter 22, that is several hundred years after the death of, of uh, David. But yet that gatekeeper is still there. That prime minister, the person who opens and closes, uh, is still there. It was perpetual. It never ended. That same thing now is being applied there to, to Peter in, in Matthew chapter 16. He has been given the keys. He is the prime minister. And, the, and while the king is away... It is his responsibility to see that office, that, that, that office is carried on, that it does not end, and that indeed that person that followed him, like Peter, would be in charge of the church of God here on earth today. In my next video, I will be giving some uh, resources from the Bible about how the uh, uh, papacy was perpetuated the authority which it used uh, through the Bible and then, then through some of the early church. I hope I've helped you some in this video. And again, Albert, I appreciate you giving us the opportunity to do this and your genuine courtesy in extending uh, the number of videos we can make on this. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them for you. Until next time, this has been Golly saying God bless.